Somebody reminded me. I think we have a chat. We got a couple of chats. Okay. Oh, oh we got a we got a little echo there. Thanks, Steve. Sorry about that. I, I if it said uh, that it started at at six o'clock. I apologize. So, um, but getting back, we looked a little bit about how they approach biblical scholarship. Um, we also looked at their habit of open-mindedness, and that really is the issue of um, instead of trying to put into the Bible our own selves and our own culture, how to understand what the original authors intended by what they wrote, and then keeping an open mind, meaning that we have to, uh, like I said, allow ourselves to be um, be transformed by the Bible or not putting our own uh, preconceived understandings of, of, of our modern culture uh, into their culture. And so uh, then we looked at what is the Bible and that explored the entire breadth of the Bible and the different literary genres and the big three were narrative, which Genesis is. Then we also looked at prose discourse. The best example was the uh, letters of Paul. And then we also looked at uh, poetry which of course Psalms, uh, uh, narrative is 44% of the Bible, is 33% of the Bible, and the remaining is prose discourse, or argument or writing that is trying to convince you of something. So that's a little bit of what we did last week. We just kind of did a groundwork of how we're looking at the Bible. Um, and we also got a chance to see who our teachers were. Tim Mackey, who is a writer and creative director for Bible Project, is a PhD in Semitic Languages and Biblical Studies. He is their core teacher. And also Jonathan Collins is their, what I call core animator, who creates the videos. And the way that our video, our series goes is that what we do is that we present a particular video and then we begin to talk about that video. And after we looked at um, how to read the Bible, and we looked at the Bible as story, we finished there last week. And so what we're going to do this week is we're going to finish that little bit of, of how to read the Bible by looking at what is Jewish meditation literature, because the entire Old Testament has a whole theme, a whole framework, a whole ideology of which, how and why they write. And before we get into Genesis, we're going to take a look at this video, video and it's going to help us to understand how to get out of our context and into the context of ancient Jewish meditation literature, which really is comprehensively the entire Bible. So are we ready for that, guys? So I did my little spill on what we did last week. Are we ready to get into our first video, to get into our first part of our uh, Bible study tonight? Yep. Yes. All right. Let's see if this works exactly as I intend. It never does. Bible's a clip. All right. Can you see? All right. Is it filling up the whole space? Collection of books written. No. 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 Okay. Hold on a second, because I thought that might happen. So I'm going to stop the share. I'm going to go back and do this. Now, is it filling up the whole space? Yes. Yes. All right. After we watch the video, it's going to be less of me talking and more me beginning to ask discussion questions and us talking together about what we just saw. And remember that what we're really trying to do is to get a comprehensive understanding of books of the Bible so that we can have a comprehensive understanding of a section of the Bible. That's what Torah is all about, that section. And as we go from here into different books throughout the year, we're going to get a comprehensive understanding of the whole Bible. So let's take a big look at what 
kind of literature the Bible so is? So the Bible is a collection of books written in different literary styles like narrative, poetry, and prose. And most of us are familiar with these kinds of literature. Yeah, we all know a narrative when we see one, like The Hunger Games or The Great Gatsby. And most people can recognize poetry, whether it's Walt Whitman or the songs of Bob Dylan. And every day we're surrounded by prose and news articles or essays. Now all of these are modern American literature and that they came from this time period and this region of the world. But there's also medieval English literature from another place in time or so each time period and culture produces its own unique kind of literature. And in order to read the Bible well, we need to keep in mind that it comes from this part of the world and was produced in this basic period of time. So what's unique about ancient English literature? Well, a key feature is that it lacks the modern readers have come to expect in the story of the poems. And this makes it seem really simple. But actually, it's very sophisticated literature. Every detail that is given matters. I am sorry. Never mind. And that's great, but the lack of detail means that stories are often loaded with ambiguities. I mean, take one of the first stories, Adam and Eve in the garden. Where did this talking snake come from? And why did God allow him there? Why didn't Adam and Eve die on the spot like God said they would? And who's this offspring of a woman who will destroy the snake but is bitten by it? Yeah, so many puzzles in this story. And some of these are questions that we have and that are not important to what the author is focusing on. But some of these ambiguities are intentional. Intentional? Won't that lead to bad interpretations, people filling in the gaps with their own answers? Well, that's a risk the biblical authors took in writing this way. We all tend to impose our own cultural assumptions onto the Bible, but they apparently thought the risk was worth it. These oddities are really invitations into an adventure of reading and discovery. So what do you mean? Well, for example, the strange promise about the offspring of the woman crushing and being bitten by the snake. That word offspring is a clue to pay attention to genealogies, which, lo and behold, run all through the biblical narrative. They trace the lineage from Eve all the way to King David and his offspring. And in the New Testament, Jesus is connected to the offspring of this world. Isaiah connected this king who would die on behalf of his people. And then in the book of Revelation, there's this symbolic vision. And can you guess? It's about a woman and her offspring. It's Jesus and his followers conquer the dragon by giving up their lives. Yeah, so each part of the story is loaded with ambiguity. <laughs> literary genius of the Bible <laughs> to keep reading and then interpret each part in light of the others. This is feeling complicated. Um, by... well, you're actually not expected to notice all of this by yourself or all at once. This dense way of writing forces you to slow down and then read carefully, embarking on this interactive discovery process through the whole biblical narrative over a lifetime of reading and rereading. Ah, okay. Meditation literature. Yeah, in Psalm 1, we read about the ideal Bible reader. It's someone who meditates on the scriptures day and night. In Hebrew, the word meditate means literally to mutter or speak quietly. The idea is that every day for the rest of your life, you slowly, quietly read the Bible out loud to yourself. And then go talk about it with your friends, pondering the puzzles, making connections, and discovering what it all means. And as you let the Bible interpret itself, something remarkable happens. The Bible starts to read you. Because ultimately, the writers of the Bible want you to adopt this story as your story. So this ancient Jewish writing style, it must create unique types of narrative and poetry and discourse. Yes, and we'll explore all of those literary styles starting next with biblical narrative. All right. Before we get going, I, I just want to we were getting some feedback from uh, the Bernardi's house, just to let you know. I don't know why it's happening. It's too close. No. We're muted, aren't we? Not now. <laughs> you can hear you through the phone. Hello. Oh, you're watching, listening through the phone, guys? We couldn't figure out the sound to work on the computer, so yep. we're using the sound from the phone because that worked. Okay, now um, 
there, there might be a little bit of feedback. It seems like it tries to take care of itself rather quickly. So let's hope that, that that's just going to continue to be the case. All right. Now, one of the first things that we looked at as to what ancient Jewish meditation literature tries to do is tries to create a story for us. Now, this is just a general beginning question, you know, throwing out there, icebreaker. What kind of stories do you guys like best? Who wants to start? Who's your favorite? What's your favorite style of story? That's a good ending. Can you read that first, Anne? <laughs> <laughs> what is a good ending? What What's a good ending to you? What do we mean, you know? Everybody would be happy at the end, but you know that that's not real life. So mm -hmm. I think the Bible stories recreate that too. Mm -hmm. That's one thing about the, the, the biblical story. We're going to see this in Genesis. And that is that the, the biblical story um, doesn't end, always end in a happy ending, does it? No. Well, it's the, I like stories that are true or could be true. They say more about that. You mean like, um, like based in historical fact or or historical reality or uh, all of that? I like to read uh, biography and I like to read history and and learn more and more about uh, where we've come as a people and where we're likely to go and mm -hmm. and the characters that are in it um, and. Um, I like the complexity that real life has in it. You know, what I also find is that the characters that I liked really dynamic characters and some of the characters I like to read about um, have no redeeming qualities whatsoever. Uh, like right now, I'm, I'm reading a little bit about the, the story of World War II. And so you try to, when you, you want to read more about Adolf Hitler because you try to understand a little bit more about how this particular person was able to um, lead uh, an entire country in a certain direction. It's just so interesting to try to figure out the psychology of it all. But doesn't mean they have redeeming value. Is there any characters that you guys uh, like in literature or like, like may not be the right word, but you found fascinating? least fiction or whatnot that that's that's a really interesting person to 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 learn about but that person really is not set up as a hero more like a villain or or anyone want to share anybody that they find fascinating mm -hmm. well i've been reading some books about uh world war ii also and it's um characters are that work in the underground in mm -hmm. france Mm -hmm. So it's been very interesting. And then you never know what the ending's going to be. I mean, the last couple of books I've read, I have no idea about the ending till, till it comes to the end. So, mm -hmm. and a lot of it's not good endings, but just what they went through during that war, because my parents were, went through that war when they were kids in Holland. So it's kind of interesting to just go back and read, read the history of, of that time. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Who, someone else said something? Look at the Old Testament stories. This is a quote. Look at uh, number three, a quote that I want us to take a look at and think about when it comes to stories, particularly the Old Testament. Uh, now, one of our teachers asked this question. Are the stories in, basically, it's a paraphrase, are the stories and characters in the Bible telling me how I should live? What was the other teacher's response when he asked that question? And what does he say the stories are intended to do? Obviously, the answer was, no, they're not intended to tell me how I should live. Anybody remember or reflect on what he said the, the characters of the stories are supposed to do? Are they supposed to show us ourselves? Yes. Isn't that interesting? I mean, think about all the major characters of the Bible. Somebody throw one out there. Just throw a major character out. Jonah. Okay, that was two at once. Who was that? I said Jonah. Jonah. I said <clears throat> okay, Jonah. Now think about Jonah. We'll just let's talk about Jonah just a little bit. Let's talk about his good character qualities. What were Jonah's good qualities that you remember? He followed God. 
Okay, in the end, didn't he? Yeah, in the end, well, yes. Any other good qualities that come to mind? What about the the qualities that when we look at aren't so good? He complained a lot. <laughs> he ran away from God. Mm -hmm. At first he said, no, I don't want to do that. The interesting thing about that is that God said, I want you to go to preach to the people of Nineveh so that they might repent and I would forgive them. And 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 what did Jonah do at first? No he way. Hated the, he hated the people in Nineveh, so he yeah. didn't want to help them. Mm -hmm. Of course, we see a turnaround in, in Jonah. And then at the very end of his story, right when they repent, what does Jonah do? He asked God to kill him <laughs> because they repented. <laughs> <laughs> he was successful. Well, well, let's pick one more other character. Somebody throw out another character. King David. King David. See, he's a lot like Noah. What are some of the good qualities of King David? He was a leader. A warrior. Leader, a warrior. He had great wisdom. Great wisdom. The Bible said he was a man after God's own heart. Yes, sir. Mm -hmm. Sometimes. He was a very, I mean, he loved God. He did. Sometimes. But he, was, he also loved women. women. Oh, yeah, he loved women. That's right. Mm -hmm. He loved especially one particular woman. Yeah. He, yeah, he committed murder over her. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. If you're looking at this, I mean, the interesting thing that I find about Jewish literature is that oftentimes the characters that mean the most in that literature have often, not always, but have more negative qualities than they do positive qualities. And one of the things that we're going to learn about um, in this Genesis passage, you're going to get a little bit more into that, is how the characters that we see throughout the Bible, and this is so interesting uh, a way for us to talk to our non-Christian friends who don't know the Bible too well and to say, look, if you really looked at the Bible, many of the characters in there are just, they have, some are just beyond redemption. What they do, you look and say, wow, that's crazy. You know, and and what uh, I think it was Sue that said this earlier, I could be wrong, could have been Margaret, but um, they said that the intent isn't for us to be like those characters but those characters are put out as a mirror or a window for us to reflect back into ourselves and to see ourselves um, in those characters. And so we're going to see a lot of that within the context of the books of the, of the story of the Bible, particularly in Genesis, we're going to see a lot of it. Now, another aspect of looking at the Bible, and this is important when it gets to the story of the Garden of Eden and sin, as our video said, and that is the Bible, uh, the writers of the Bible left a lot of ambiguity and purposely so. Now, when it says the teachers say that a risk of ambiguity is that it can lead to bad interpretations. What do you think about this particular statement? Do you feel that the Bible is ambiguous the way that the, our teacher said that it is? And if so, what do you think? Does it lead to bad interpretations? What do you think about the, the possibility that the Bible is ambiguous in its storytelling? Well, I think if you just look at the history of mankind and religion and how people get ticked off at somebody in a particular denomination or organization and decide they interpret something a different way. And so they take off and start their own denomination or their own group or whatever. And Pretty soon you've got people all over the map in terms of their uh, interpretations, which are based on their own ideas, their own thoughts and wishes, uh, as opposed to trying to grasp the central themes of the Bible or whatever. And I think that uh, in some cases, uh, you get a lot of false prophets based on uh, personally interpreting the Bible in ways that it should not have ever been done. Mm -hmm. And that's all I've got to say about that. Yeah. <laughs> that's why I always say on Trinity Sunday, whenever I start preaching, I'm probably going to be a heretic by the end of the sermon. 
Now, at the end of our video, our authors really talk to us a little bit about who the ideal Bible reader is. Specifically, I think Dave fleshed it out a little bit more than they had time for on the, the difficulties uh, with the ambiguity of scripture and how we get bad interpretations. But what they also said that, that the intention of the writers is that they had an intention of a certain way that the Bible would be read. And if I'm going to be quoting from what they said, someone, the ideal Bible reader then at the end of their video said, is someone who meditates on scriptures day and night, every day for the rest of your life. And then go about, go talk about with friends, making connections and discovering what it all means. The ambiguity is intended for us to have to go back to the story over and over and over again and look at it anew every day. I feel that way all the time. I feel like when I, let's say I read the story of uh, the Garden of Eden, that, uh, you know, I'll get something different all the time because maybe the ambiguity or the different open-endedness or, or maybe just something I just glommed onto that particular time. And that's an interesting aspect of the Bible. It isn't supposed to be read from cover to cover. I finished it. I'm done. It's supposed to be opened every day. We're supposed to dwell on it every day. Are you guys ready for that? <laughs> yes. It, it really makes me think, I mean, a little bit more about the, um, when you think about how modern Jews, really like the Hasidic Jews or, or those who are very fiercely um, into their, um, I guess, Judaic life. I mean, there is still this, understanding that the scriptures need to be dwelt on every day and not just for five minutes a day or 10 minutes a day but every day for hours a day and and if you also know that because of that um if you look at the time of jesus you would see that the average citizen or israelite who more than likely couldn't read or write knows more scripture by memory than you and i today because it was a part of their life to dwell on a day and night. And it was memorized from a very early age. Mm -hmm. That's true. We're going to get into our Genesis passage now. And we're going to see, we're going to flesh out some of these themes that were just talked about in, in literature and see a little bit now how the story of Genesis reflects this ambiguity, reflects how this ancient Jewish Mediterranean writing, uh, but also reflects to us a story that we know all too well. And so I'm going to click on this. I'm going to stop the share and I'm going to click on that. And we're going to get right into it. first book in the Bible is a book you've probably heard of. It's called Genesis. Genesis comes from a Hebrew word. Uh, it's pronounced reshit, uh, and it just means beginning. Now, there's a lot of stories from the book of Genesis, and it's easy just to pull out a specific story and, and try to tell you what it might mean. But we think the best way to understand this book is to look at the book as a whole and show you how the whole thing is designed. The book is designed to fall into two main parts. You have uh, chapters 1 through 11, which is telling the story of God and the whole world. And then you have the second part, which is about God and Abraham's family as chapters 12 through 50. And how the two of those parts relate, that's where you find the message of the book. Okay, so let's start back at the beginning. The first part of Genesis begins with a creation story where God creates everything. And how exactly that happens, of course, that's where all the debates come. But he takes a dark, watery, chaos and he turns it into a beautiful garden where humans can, can flourish that sounds nice it does sound nice in fact seven different times god says of all that he's made that it's good and this is where we meet the first human characters in the bible adam and eve they're they're both individual characters but they're also representative adam is the hebrew word for humanity and eve is the hebrew word for life 
And God creates them in his image. In other words, humanity reflects or is meant to reflect the, the, the creativity, the goodness and character of the creator out into the world that he's made. And they're supposed to reproduce and make cultures and neighborhoods and art and gardens and, and everything else. But he gives them a, a moral choice about how they're going to go about building this world. And this is what the tree of the knowledge of good and evil is all about. And he tells them, don't eat of the fruit of this tree or you will die. What's that all about? So up till now, God has been the one defining and providing what is good. And so God is the one with the knowledge of good and evil. But now this tree represents a choice. Will the humans trust God's definition of good and evil? Or are they going to seize the opportunity and define good and evil for themselves? And Adam and Eve eat the fruit. This is the core biblical explanation for that concept of sin, that desire to call the shots myself. It's the inward turn of the human heart to do what's good for me and my tribe, even if it's at the expense of you and, and your tribe. And the problem is humans are horrible at defining good and evil without God. And so now that humanity's made this choice, things get really, really, they're really bad. So Genesis 3 through 11 is like tracing this downward spiral of all, all humanity. So Adam and Eve, they can't trust each other anymore. And so there's a little story about how they were naked and felt fine about it beforehand, but now they feel shameful because all of a sudden Adam's definition of good and evil might be different than Eve's. And so they hide from each other. Then there's another story of temptation. Cain is jealous of his brother Abel and he gives in and kills him. There's a story right after Cain about a guy named Lamech. And all we know about Lamech is that he accumulates wives like property. And he sings songs about how he's a more violent, vengeful person than Cain ever was. And he's proud of it. Things get so bad with the human race that we see God decide to just wipe us out. Yeah, we typically think of the flood story is about God being angry, but it actually begins with God's sadness and grief about the state of his world. And so out of his passion to preserve the goodness of his world, he washes it clean with the flood. But there's a glimmer of hope. He, he chooses Noah and his whole family, and he saves them on this boat. Yeah, don't forget about the animals. Right, and the animals. So Noah and his family are going to reboot all of humanity. I mean, he must be a pretty great guy. But this is the story most people don't know because it's kind of weird is that Noah gets off the boat and he plants a vineyard and he gets totally plastered and then something <laughs> sketchy happens in his tent with his son. It's a tragic story. So from here humanity grows again but things are as bad as before and the last story is the famous story of the Tower of Babel. And in this story you have all of the nations uniting together to use this new technology they have, the brick. And they want to make a name for themselves and build this big city with a huge tower that will reach up to the gods. But God knows that this city will be a nightmare. And so in his mercy, he scatters them. And all of these stories, they're underlining the same basic idea. When humans seize autonomy from God, when they define good and evil for themselves, it results in a world of tragedy and death. And this leaves you wondering, is there any hope for humanity? Yes, yeah, there is. It's the very next story that answers that question. It's the beginning of God's mission to rescue and restore his world. Hey there, this is Tim. This is John. We believe... Okay. So before we get to our questions, anybody have some initial reaction or thoughts to the first 11 chapters of Genesis? Isn't it great that we can read Genesis in six minutes? At least the first half. <laughs> yeah. Anybody think that they can sum up the problem? And the, and the, so at least right now, we see a lot of the problem. Anybody want to kind of put into their own words what they just saw? Problem is sin. And what is sin? Against God. Anything that we do that's against God's wishes. Yeah, I was just, can I, I'll redefine that. What, how did they define sin? 
uh, making decisions on their own. Mm -hmm. That's contrary to that. Yeah, I was thinking about that when they, they made what well, they chose to decide for themselves the difference between good and evil. They wanted to be the ones who were the decision makers. And uh, I don't know about you, I like being a decision maker. <laughs> I was like, raise your hand if you like being in charge of your own life. <laughs> <laughs> yeah so it's interesting the definition of sin that we see is that we are taking upon ourselves the choice to be our own what is best for us what is right for us what is good and what is bad for us and that's interesting is that different than what you might understand as sin because i when i heard when i heard of it i said oh that I don't know if everybody would agree exactly with that, though I really like the way that they put it, but I thought I'd throw that out there and ask, what do you guys think about that? Is that a way that you think about sin? Mm -hmm. I just got to, mm -hmm. <laughs> What about when he talks about how Adam and Eve, that when they both became the, um, both ate of the fruit, they both became their own decision makers. At that point, they realized they couldn't trust each other. And that's when they separated and clothed themselves because they couldn't trust each other in their nakedness. And that nakedness also has much more meaning than just being without clothes. Yeah. Boy. <clears throat> So what would you say that the purpose of the Garden of Eden is then? The story. It shows you have consequences to the choices you make. Mm -hmm. Anyone else? Now the name Adam, which means humanity and Eve, which means life have great significance to the story. What does being Adam and Eve being made in the image of God mean to you? Let me put that a different way. Adam means humanity, Eve means life. And in our story, in our video, they talk about those two things put together means that the Adam and Eve ref have the character of God kind of imbued into them because they are made in the image of God. And their purpose is to take that character out into the world. Now, you, we in our lives may have thought about what it really means to be made in the image of God. We may have an idea of what that means. So what I'm asking you is, is what does it mean to you? When I say you, I'll even, I'll pick one, I'll pick somebody. Jeremy Bernardi, you are made in the image of God. Not that I'm asking Jeremy this question, but I can ask that of everyone. What does that mean to you? Anybody want to feel that one? Very subjective question. Mm -hmm. so I get it. Well, I I don't know that uh, I don't know that it means that we're meant to physically look like God, uh, but. From a spiritual standpoint, I think we all, um, oh, God wanted us all to be imbued with those qualities of humanity and, and life, etc., and to obey him and his commands and, and his plan for the world. But then he, he, some people might say he made a mistake by giving Adam and Eve a choice where they could say, well, I don't want to do that. I want to find out something else. And, and that meant that uh, maybe our image uh, in, isn't the same as God's anymore because we are looking at things from a sinful perspective uh, that guides us and uh, as opposed to the sort of more pure method that he had for us originally. I don't know, I'm waxing poetic and I need to stop. Well, that, well that's the kind of question I was really asking. You know, I was asking for a waxing poetic answer. <laughs> well, except that God doesn't make mistakes. So it wasn't a mistake. 
I think he, that whole purpose in that is so that he could send Jesus Christ down to save us. So that. that you just made me think about now that is a uh, very theological question that I uh, we debated at seminary and other times. You know, you say, did God did, did God place sin into the world so that he could bring Jesus into the world? Yes. Because no. he wrote it that in the very beginning. That, that's what it said. That's what the prophets talked about in the Old Testament. They talked about Jesus mm -hmm. coming. I mean, there was a whole purpose for that. Mm -hmm. I mean, if God had wanted to create a perfect world, then he would never have introduced the potential for sin. Mm. Yeah, the um, the character that is going to crush the serpent who is this entity that is opposed to the will of God and tries to move Adam and Eve away from abiding in his will um, this uh, that that character is introduced before sin actually exists within the context of God's creation and Eden and Adam and Eve. But the character that will crush that serpent is not introduced until after um, sin enters into the world. Yeah, I don't, there's never going to be a right answer to, for the, on this one. Uh, but I do think, Amy, that I would probably um, go on the other side of that in the sense that um, God's well, Paul writes in Romans chapter 12 that Jesus is the new Adam and that as all died in, in Adam, so all are made alive in Christ. And so um, in the sense, if Jesus is the new Adam, I think that Paul was probably writing that the intention of Adam was never to fall from grace. And so I think that in that sense, I, there's no way I could even really get into uh, the best answers for this. But I think that I might be on the other side of that and say that I, I don't think that it was intention of God for sin to ever enter into the world. And that gets into a whole bunch of other questions like free will. Um, so Well, so then why would God have only certain people that from the beginning are known to be saved and other people aren't if there was never sin introduced then how how is that explained i would think that the intention was that all people would be saved all people would be in a right relationship with god uh, be, being born in his image living out his image in the world um in, in his perfect in his perfect world there's there's probably about oh gosh over a thousand chapters in the bible and uh that world only exists in in two chapters <laughs> it goes out pretty quickly but he allowed in the humanity to have choice mm -hmm. that is that that is a very theologically tricky area is there real, is, you know, that's the beginning to number two, number four. Yeah, the tree represents a choice. Therefore, it represents that choice um, was there from the very beginning and it defines our relationship with God. And it actually defines sin is what our teachers were telling us in the video. Now, the question that I put in here is what is this choice? And do you agree with that definition of sin? Remember what the definition of sin was? Mm -hmm. It wasn't saying you're a horrible, terrible person. You're saying that what it was, it was that you are choosing to be your own decision maker and not allowing God to be that decision maker and trusting in that decision. Gosh, I love how on these questions, I think they're brilliant when I write them down and then I come back to them and I go, oh, I, I need to write better questions. <laughs> now here's question number five. This was really fascinating to me. And so I wonder if it's fascinating to you, but um, 
the, our video describes Genesis chapter 3 through 11 as the downward spiral of all humanity. Now, why do you think characters in these stories from Adam to the Tower of Babel they get things so wrong? You ever notice that? Do you notice how each character from then into Abram? <coughs> I mean, they just get things totally and amazingly wrong. The longer the time from creation and the more generations, the farther they got from God. They didn't feel the pull to God. They didn't feel connected to God. And the farther they got from God, the more sinful they became. Mm. Do you have other thoughts on that? I mean, I really appreciate that, Cindy. <clears throat> I'm not looking for a right answer. I'm just looking for more uh, interaction. But has it really ever gotten that much better? Oh. <laughs> That's the question that, that our videos actually ask. Has it ever gotten that much better? Are we more or less as just as simple today as we see and in, in, throughout the first part of the book of Genesis? Even more. Yes. Pretty much. Yeah. More. more of us, more sin. It's interesting, sin is not as something that is uh, limited to a culture. It's actually something to do with our hearts. And I think it has to do with this decision that, that the theology, if you look at the, the idea of original sin, which um, St. Augustine really um, kind of plays out in the early fourth century, talking about uh, original sin and how each and every man and woman that's ever born after Adam and Eve are tainted by sin because of their sin. It's like we are stuck in that time right at, you know, as soon as sin entered the world. No matter how much progress we've gotten, we have the same amount of sin as we did in the Bronze Age as we do in this age. Mm -hmm. So what's the answer? That's the story of the Bible. Now, one of the things that was in our first video about how one of the, the, the objects of reading scripture is to see ourselves in the stories. Do you see yourself in this story? And if so, how does it affect you? One way that I see myself in the story is I say to myself, by the grace of God go I, I could be just like, I mean, or, or in many ways I am. I could be right there in Babylon trying to put brick upon brick. What hope do I have? Right. I've got sin. I see, I see the, the difficulty and the struggle in my own heart kind of helps me understand a little bit more maybe to be kinder and more understanding um towards in a sense all different kinds of sins not in order to justify them but in order to be able to see it from god's perspective of who jesus is his purpose and what that means for us so let's go to the next video. This is our Genesis video. Genesis. This is our verses, chapters 12 through 50. We only went through chapters 1 through 11 before. Now we're going to go through 12 through 50. The interesting thing about this video is it's one minute shorter than our last video. <laughs> no, sorry. Are we ready? Here we go.
and through the book of Genesis, which is made up of these two main parts. And the first part begins in the garden, where we watch humanity spiral downward in self-destruction, and it ends in the Tower of Babel, where a rebellious humanity is scattered by God. Then the second part of Genesis zooms in and focuses on just one family. And right in the middle is this story that links the two parts of Genesis together and helps us understand what the whole book is all about. So how do we get from the Tower of Babel to the story here in the middle? Well, after the scattering at Babel, there's this genealogy, and it follows one of the tribes all the way down to this one guy named Abram. You probably know him as Abraham. And God starts making all these promises to Abraham, like he's going to bless him and give him a ton of kids. And he says that through him and his family, all the nations of the earth are now going to find God's blessing. So basically, God is trying to restore humanity back to the goodness of the garden and to his original intentions for the world. So it's like his rescue plan for humanity. And that's why the whole second half of Genesis is about this one family. And so you have, you have Abraham, and then he has a son, Isaac, who has Jacob, and then Jacob has 12 sons. And to each generation, God renews his promise to bless them and all nations through them. So because of this promise to use this family to rescue the world, it's pretty easy to read these stories as examples of how to be a good person. But actually, for the most part, this family is totally dysfunctional. So for example, let's go back to Abraham. This whole story is about God giving him and his wife Sarah a family, but two different times. He basically gives Sarah away to other men by denying that she's even his wife. And then Sarah gets impatient about having a son, and so she makes Abraham sleep with her servant girl, which then causes all of these other problems in the family. So they get really old, and you begin to think that there's no way they're going to have a kid of their own. But then, miraculously, they do. It's Isaac. And Isaac, he has two sons, Esau and Jacob, and things are going pretty good. But Jacob... The younger brother wants the family's inheritance, which belongs to Esau, the older brother. So he devises a plan where he's going to steal it from his father, Isaac, who at this point in the story is now old and blind. Which who does the horrible stealing from your blind father? Yeah, and then he just takes off. So Jacob goes on from there to have 12 sons, big family. But Jacob loves his 11th son, Joseph, way more than all the others. And so he gives him the special technicolor dream coat and his brothers because of this come to hate him so much so that they plan on killing him but they don't they instead just sell him as a slave down in egypt now while in egypt through this crazy series of events joseph goes from being in a prison cell to becoming the second in command there and so later on the the whole middle east falls into this food shortage and joseph's brothers they come down to egypt looking for food and then when they get there Who should they find as the ruler of the whole land? It's Joseph, that guy they sold into slavery. But he actually saves them from starving to death. And so here you have it. These are the great-grandchildren of Abraham who have done this heinous act to their brother. But God has transformed their evil into something good. And that's exactly what Joseph says here in the last paragraph of the entire book. He says, you guys planned all of this for evil, but God planned it. For good to save people's lives now these words they conclude the book because they actually summarize the message of the whole story so far humans keep choosing evil and we are thinking they're they're screwing up god's plan but he keeps turning their evil back into good and somehow he's going to use this family to restore humanity back to the garden so that's the book of genesis but we still don't know how exactly he's going to use this family to bring us back to the garden. Well, yeah, but this is just the first book. So that's what the rest of the Bible sets out to answer. Okay. First thoughts on this particular video. Covers a lot of territory. It does. So, other thoughts? Okay, now, go ahead. Uh, Father, I just thought uh, uh, he failed with all the money, but then he, he began again to mm-hmm. uh, 
to establish the perfect world with with uh, with, with Joseph. You know, he made, it's a second attempt of creating this perfect world. Uh, I find that interesting, and doing it with a, a one person. Well, let's let's look at that. So, the Garden of Eden, right? Right. Adam and Eve, humanity and life. When they sin, where's the next place? Who's the next character in the Bible that God begins again with? Abraham. No. No. Noah. Noah. Lord. Noah. Okay. Okay, so Noah is the next character that God begins with. And then we look at to the end of chapter 11 of Genesis and what's happened. Where did we get at the end of chapter 11? What, what did, the, what did the, the story of Genesis tell us? It didn't yeah. work. It didn't, it didn't work. work. Tower, yeah, Tower of Babel. They were worse off than ever. Yeah. And so right. destroying uh -huh. the, what does God do? Abram... Uh, though it's never specifically said, it's intended for us, I think, to understand that Abram is leaving Babel. Leaving Babel, and God is going to start again. And so the third time he starts again, this is the beginning of the nation of Israel. But when we begin to look at the nation of Israel, and the promise that God has with him is that you will be able to, I will bless the whole world with you, and you're Descendants will be like more numerous than the stars in the sky. And, um, and so one of the interesting things about this story to me is look just exactly where they're going in this progression. Abraham has who? Isaac. And Isaac is really basically the best of the lot, maybe because they didn't describe his story a whole lot. But... <laughs> The, 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 he, there's not, not a whole lot that, that went wrong with Isaac. But then he has Jacob. Mm -hmm. Right? Well, Isaac has two and two sons. Well, you know what Isaac, he did. He had two wives, Rebecca and Leah, and that, that didn't go. Too well. <laughs> and then Jacob. And then Jacob steals his father's blessing. Just steals the birthright of his brother. So that didn't go well. But then God uses Jacob. And then he has 12 brothers, 12 children, one of whom gets sold into slavery by his other brothers simply because, yeah, Jacob, I like, <laughs> how many of you like going around? I'm going to stop sharing because I want to ask this question. How many of you have ever had your kids ask you, who do you like best? Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know what my answer is? And you're going to say, I can't believe you say that, Father Rob. I say, well, I'm not sure, but I know it's not you. <laughs> <laughs> and then they look at me and I say, what kind of question is that? <laughs> if you ask a crazy question, you're going to get a crazy answer. I don't let them leave until I tell them, you know, say, is it, that's just, that's a silly question. So I said, can God pick who he likes best? And my daughter Penny once said, well, of course he does. <laughs> he can pick, you know, and just, it was just so funny. So, but looking at this progression, it isn't a, isn't it interesting? And I'm going to throw this out there for discussion that what we're looking at is each of the characters in this family line that's in Genesis, because we don't get to Moses till Exodus. Each of these people in this family line, it's how God completes his promises through them, even though they're totally inept <laughs> and, and because of the sin that still pervades our hearts. <laughs> what does that say to you about God's plan? He's hopeful. Oh, very hopeful. Oh my goodness. I love that, that idea. Uh -huh. This God, if you look at all the characters of the Bible, not just the characters in Genesis, what I hope you see is that look how badly they screwed it all up and still God overcame it. And if they can screw it up that bad, I don't think I'm doing any, I can do any worse. <laughs> and God's promises can still happen in and through me. What did the video and our teachers in the video say about that at the very end? They said there's kind of a tagline at the very end that really gets to the heart of how God is operating in this story. Anybody remember? You guys, you guys have screwed it all up, but God's helped put it back together. 
Mm -hmm. I think it's really fascinating how what the role of humanity is in all of this mm -hmm. in terms of how um, flawed people are in terms of decision making, their capacity for jealousy, etc. And it's really interesting that uh, God would imbue Adam and Eve with humanity as well as life and then the flaws of humanity keep throwing themselves up. Mm -hmm. All the way through the story, forcing God to have to figure out how to mm -hmm. honor his promise. So thinking about that statement from David, I really like that statement. If um, the flaws in humanity keep screwing things up, what is God going to need to do to make things right? When God pulls us closer to him or we get knocked closer to him, he, any way he gets us closer to him, he will direct our paths and correct our mistakes. Mm -hmm. But the farther we get from him, the more likely we will make mistakes over and over again until we decide to come back to him. Mm. Now, how do you think, now that we've gone through the Genesis, this is my last question on my discussion questions here. How do you feel that we can begin to see the story from beginning to end? Do you need anything else to see the big picture or can you see the picture already forming in this? Well, you, you need to get a, a, a covenant or a promise from God to, so that we can see his direction. I don't, have we, we had one so far? Yes. I mean, a, a big one was Abraham, but I'm, I'm trying to see him before that in, in Genesis. We do. I think we have several covenants that, that we see. Abraham is the definitive covenant that we've seen so far, but I think that you can still see that we have a covenant with God and Adam and Eve as they all walk together in the garden before sin happens. And then sin breaks that covenant. And then you see God trying to restore uh, humanity through the flood and redoing it through one man. And but, so God is. Well, we haven't gotten that far yet, have we? Well, yes, in general. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, well, yeah. oh, I missed something. <laughs> and then from remember the spiraling downward from, from Noah all the way down to Babel. And then God really, but God actually, there's no specified covenant made between Adam and Eve and God or Noah and God. The first specified covenant that we see is actually through Abraham. And, Abraham. And the first, the way that we see that there's a covenant, this is very important in Jewish literature, is that God changes Abraham. Oh, the rainbow. That's right. Uh, now, God had, he did have a covenant with Noah, though, by creating the rainbow. It was a promise that never again would he flood yeah. the earth mm -hmm. and destroy everything with a flood. I better give my MDiv back. I missed that. <laughs> <laughs> Or watch a longer version. <laughs> we also see that God continues his covenant through Abraham's family when he changes Jacob's name to Israel. And Israel means one who um, one who wrestled with God and, and prevailed. Isn't that an interesting name to, to help understand this story? Look, if you look at the names that are chosen, like Adam and Eve, Jacob's name turns to, to Abraham. We see these no. continue to go. Abram. Abram. <laughs> Abram to Abraham. Abram to Abraham. Yes. yes. Jacob to Israel. Yes. And then you see the meaning behind those names. You see that all throughout this Genesis, and you're going to see this for the rest of the Old Testament, even even into today, really, is that the story of God and his people is about the struggle of God against the sin that taints us. And the one who struggles with God and prevails really is a foreshadowing. And I think these stories are all moving towards the fact that, that not one of us, because of the sin that is in our hearts, is going to be able to prevail against that sin. And therefore, God is going to have to provide that champion for us. 
And we see from the very beginning of, of Genesis where the heir of the woman, of the, you know, of Adam and Eve, their heir is going to crush that sin. And now the whole story of the Bible really moves into the reality of that being done, um, that it is a, it's a heart issue. It's really a matter of our hearts. It's not about the law, or that's what Paul really talks about. It isn't about how well we keep the law because we none of us can keep it on our own. We can't make our own decision to keep it. We all fail miserably. And so our hearts have to be at the center of this. And that, that's where the story is going. That's where the story of Genesis is taking us. And how our hearts aren't able to do that and they're always bending towards evil, but what we meant for evil, God is gonna use for good. Now we've gotten into 738, and my hope is to have a one hour meeting. So who wants to, uh, anybody have some final thoughts on, the, on our Genesis? We're not actually going through it line by line. We're using the videos to have an overview of each book of the Bible. That's all we can do in an hour uh, for each one. Does anybody wanna have our final thoughts this week? Your final thought on, on when we went through this, is there something just significant that really jumps out at you after looking at both of these videos? I guess my only thought is looking at the videos and doing it in this way, uh, you actually get a better overall picture than reading it and trying to figure it out yourself. Yeah, that's one of the things that, that the videos uh, the email that I sent out does is that there's there's um, podcasts to go deeper into all of these issues. There's blogs, there's writings that they have on there. So if you want to keep going deeper and listen to more, probably about 10, 12, one hour uh, podcasts on each on on Genesis, you can <laughs> have at it, or you can read the Bible. <laughs> okay. Well, guys, next week, what we're going to be doing is Exodus. Here's my little tagline for everybody. Plagues, locusts, rivers of blood, the Red Sea, water from a rock, manna and quail, lots and lots of complaining, idol worship, and sin. And what's that? A covenant, the giving of the law, a renewed promise, and a promised land? Outstanding. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's where we're gonna get into this. But the interesting thing, I think we're gonna see the cycle repeated that, we, that we've seen in Genesis. Again, it's gonna continue throughout the entire Bible. And really it's going to point, that's why it always points forward to someone who can break that cycle and why that someone simply can't be a human being, but is in the line of David that God promised. So, Thank you guys for coming tonight. We'll be back again next week with the book of Exodus, and we'll continue to get a, a better comprehensive look at where we're going and where God's going in his story of the Bible. Thanks for coming tonight. Any last questions, anyone? All right. I wrote everybody's name down that was here, and... Um, I hope you all don't mind. I recorded this so that we could offer that recording to anyone who couldn't join us and uh, they might be able to watch it and uh, catch back up for next week. Thanks, all right, father. 6.30 next week. Thank you, Father. Thank you. All right. Thanks. Very good. Take care, guys. Bye. Bye. Good night. Good night. Good night.